Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter Select, a seasonal podcast where we bounce back and forth between a series, exploring its evolution, design, and legacy. For season five, we are covering the Resident Evil franchise. My name is Max Roberts, and I am joined, as always, by Logan Moore. Hi, Logan. Max, how about after this podcast, you take me back to your place and we have some overtime? <laughs> I oh, as you started talking, I didn't know where you were going with that, and I was like, I thought he was going to open up with the uh, the sh- the salesman, like what you buying, and then he comes in here with the Ashley jet ski line, which is fantastic. <laughs> Good job, sir. Good job. We can have some overtime later after the show. Promise. Okay. Or, wait, Good. no, that's not what he says. <laughs> no, that's not what he says because Leon is not a pedophile. Thank Good God. Good job, Leon. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, it had been a while. I mean, it had been a while before since I had played this game. So when I heard that line at the end, I was like, wait a minute, please tell me that this isn't going where I think it's going. And then Leon's like, no, thanks. I'm just here to kill the zombies and make yeah. out with my super spy girlfriend who's not really my girlfriend. Anyway, Resident Evil 4, interesting game that we're going to talk about today. A very interesting game. So on this episode, we will have a guest joining us. Uh, Dustin Furman, uh, the executive producer of Last Stand Media, is going to join us here in a moment to talk through Resident Evil 4 with us. But until then, Max, let's do our typical rundown of everything related to uh, Resident Evil 4 here. As with every other game this season, it was developed and published by Capcom, except the VR version, which was made by Armature. I invoke the VR version because Max has played that version of the game and he's going to talk about it here on this episode, mm-hmm. I think, a bit. A little uh, bit. So we will we, we will bring it up a little bit, but it's not going to be the basis of our discussion by any means. Uh, it originally released on the GameCube, later came to the PS2. It's come to everything. It's been on PS2, PC, Wii, mobile devices, PS3, 360, PS4, Xbox One, Switch. The VR version's on MetaQuest 2. Um, it originally launched though, uh, on January 11th, 2005, and then was later ported to all those other platforms over the past over 15 years. The game director was Shinji Mikami. Once again, the producer was Hiroyuki Kobayashi and the music this time around was done by Mizao Sinbogi or Sinbongi. I think it is, uh, this game's Metacritic score overall, as you would expect, Very, very high. Uh, It scored a 96 out of 100 on Metacritic, making it one of the best-reviewed games of all time. Uh, Resident Evil 4 has, for the longest time, been considered one of the best games of all time, and I think it's also been considered the best game in the Resident Evil series since it first released. That is the thing I've always heard about Resident Evil 4. It's the best Resident Evil game. It's never... As someone who was coming into this series fairly fresh... I always knew Resident Evil 4 was the the peak, or at least yes. fans perceived it that way. Yes, that is what his... They're all different and influential in their own ways, but Resident Evil 4 is the one that is always mentioned the most by critics and fans and everybody. And it, it is a greatly influential game, and we're, uh, we're going to talk about all those things throughout this episode. Its influence, whether or not it's still maybe the best Resident Evil game of the bunch, and... Hmm things like that. But to do that, uh, let's bring in our guest here, Dustin Furman. Dustin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Um, I like being able to come on a show just to talk about like one game and really deep dives. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. uh, To give everybody some uh, background. So you are with uh, Last Stand Media, which we mentioned up front. I reached out to you. So the time we're recording this is in October, November. The time this is publishing is months down the road. But I reached out to you in the summer because you were rapid fire playing through all the resident evil games and i think you had just finished playing three and you mentioned that you were going to go to four soon and i hit you up and i was like hey would you want to do this with us instead and not yeah. play four right now and you're like yeah sure so uh thank you for being patient there yeah and then uh, and then a week later on sacred symbols it was like uh i'm gonna take a break from resident evil i was like ah, well I honestly i needed the break at that point um not that i was I don't know. It wasn't like Resident Resident Evil 3 remake was bad or anything like that, but playing one, two, three in a row, it's like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's time to give it a little pause. And so the pause was, was perfect. It it worked out great. So that was no problem at all for me. Yeah. So we've all played Resident Evil 4 here in, or I guess what was Halloween month. It's now November. Uh, And I feel like that made a good, uh, 
I don't know. That was a good start to the month, I guess, for me. Broadly speaking, though, let's dive into our histories with the game. Dustin, we can start with you. Uh, I assume you have played Resident Evil 4 before, but maybe I am wrong. What is kind of Mm. your own backstory with this game? Well, this was the part of the show that I wasn't looking forward to, uh, embarrassing myself in that (laughs) I realized because I couldn't remember if I'd ever finished this game. Mm. And when I played it, I realized I definitely had not finished it or played it all the way through. I remember my first experience with this game actually playing it was when the Wii version came out, uh, which I I don't even know what year that would have been. Um, But I think that I think I played through most up until some point in the castle section of the game on Wii. And then I I don't know. I'm trying to think that might have been junior high. It might have freaked me out a little too much. I was probably even a wimp back then. Uh, or something like that. but So I realized I'd never finished this game before. And so going through and actually playing it, what's interesting when you have a game like this that is so beloved and so well known throughout the industry and, and by fans and stuff like that, is that even though I hadn't played it all the way through, I kind of knew like the different sections and seeing like later on, there's the enemy with the spikes that come out of him. I was like, ah, yeah, I, I, I've seen that before and stuff like that. So it was great to finally actually play through all the way and uh, see what this game's all about. I, I think what's funny is, and Max, you can talk to this. Max has never played this game at all, oh. period. So uh, nope. you are you are not the most novice player of Resident here. Evil 4 on this panel. Max, I guess, did you did you feel a similar way in that sense? Did you feel like you had an, an idea of a lot of what was coming around the corner in this game because it's just been so ubiquitous for, I don't know, 15 years or more? No. All, all I knew about Resident Evil 4 before was one time a coworker when I worked at Kmart in high school, they had me over at their place. He's like, you got to try this game out. And I got through the village. He also tried this with Dark Souls, and I just got stepped on by the giant creature at the start of that game. <laughs> but in Resident Evil 4, I get to the village, and the, the villagers just swarm you, and the chainsaw man shows up. He's like, isn't this great? I'm like, this game's weird. <laughs> and I didn't play it because I didn't own it. Um, and then I always had heard of the chainsaw guy. I even knew about the chainsaw GameCube controller, which I've only seen once in person. You know, I remember that thing, dude. I remember seeing it at GameStop and being like, "What is this? It's so cool! Like, what is this? It's like, how do you even hold it? <laughs> I, I could you just imagine playing Smash or anything with it? It'd be awesome. <laughs> they need so, to do it again for the remake. They really do. A, they, a has someone sense? beaten it with Dark? Played Dark Souls with the the with the chainsaw control? Mm-hmm. I feel like that has to be out there. That has to be a thing. If they can sure. do it with the DK bongo drums, they can do it with the chainsaw. Definitely. So, so I played just that part. And then I knew you escorted the president's daughter around and I heard there was an island because I listened to original sound chat. They did an episode on Resident Evil 4 and Banjo-Kazooie and they talk about the plot of the game a little bit. And But really, I had no idea. I didn't know there was a castle. I didn't know there was a tiny Napoleon man. Uh, I didn't know there was a Las Plagas virus in your blood. Nothing, man. All I knew was you were Leon and there's a village. Okay, so that makes me the most experienced person here. And honestly, uh, I've played this game once prior to us recording this. I played this before. I've told my story on this season of the podcast already, how I was playing through all of the games before Resident Evil 5 came out. That was kind of my introduction uh, to the series. By the time I got to Resident Evil 4 in my series playthrough, though, I was like, all right, this is the one that's going to be not necessarily good because I didn't dislike all the other ones previously, but it was the one that I thought was going to amp things up. And I remember thinking at the time that I was like, I don't know if that was as good as it was hyped up. And now that I have played it again, I kind of feel the same way. Um, And I guess maybe Mm -hmm. we can segue this into our broad feelings on the game. I don't think this is a bad video game by any means. In fact, it's pretty darn good. It's not, age the best though and i think that's something we can touch on a little bit more especially i mean we're going to naturally talk about the remake it's hard to talk about this game nowadays without talking about the remake that's going to be out in what five months or something like that but yeah this game i do not think is 
all that good by modern standards, and it's kind of harder to go back to than I thought it would be. Um, I don't know if the same was true for either of you guys. Um, I think you get used to how this game operates the longer that you play it, but the first couple hours there were especially a little bit rough going back to, especially because there's so many modern ports of the game too. Like I thought those modern ports would have some quality of life improvements, and that's just not the case. So, so before playing Resident Evil Four on PS4 or on the PS5, I guess whatever. In June, I started playing it in VR. I just wanted to try VR, and I had a Quest 2, and so I played almost all of the game, found out I was actually like one safe spot away from the final boss, played the whole game essentially in VR, and then started playing the regular port. And I think the first thing I texted you, Logan, was, these controls suck. Yeah. (laughs) Coming from fluidity of movement with an analog stick in VR where I can move and do whatever to tank controls just felt really bad and i would have thought a ps4 port of the game would have given it proper dual analog controls or something but yeah i i struggled definitely at the beginning of this game with uh kind of the crustiness of the age of it a little bit well (laughs) what's funny about that too i i I have to mention this is when we did our uh, resident evil one episode max we played the remake uh the modern version of remake on ps4 and xbox Mm -hmm. one which does change the control scheme. It doesn't do tank controls anymore. So Max has never done actual proper tank controls in a Resident Evil game. And his first introduction Mm. to it was Resident Evil 4, which I found funny because that's the one where it's probably least apparent or at least least, uh, annoying because it's from a different perspective. So that was really funny to me to get that text from you asking what the heck the controls were and uh, how does this work. How do I run? Why am I aiming and stopping? How does this work? It's, it's funny hearing you talk about the getting used to it because for me, and I think I told you guys a little bit um, in our Discord chat before in the, in the weeks leading up is that when I started, I started with mouse and keyboard because I thought this will be the way to get the most precise aiming uh, <laughs> since I know the aiming is a little uh, screwy, a little dated at this point. I don't know what is going on with the mouse keyboard controls this game. Maybe there's a mod to fix it, but it's horrendous. It's so bad. So I decided then I thought maybe I'll go old school and check out the Wii version because a lot of people really like the controls on that. And unfortunately, it just I don't know. I have a pretty small CRT and it is widescreen. So it was like even smaller, like there's no full screen version. And then I even went as far to plugging in my Wii U and trying it on my 4K TV. And it just, it looked horrendous, like absolutely (laughs) horrible. And I thought, okay, I just need to, you know what? We're we're talking about this game. I'm not going to get a GameCube and play it that way, but I will try to do it in a more authentic way. So I played it either on Steam Deck or on PC with a controller. And I I considered that HD mod, which I think that uh, we'll talk about that at some point, but... I couldn't get it to work, which usually I'm pretty good at mod stuff like that, but it it consistently didn't work. So I was like, you know what? Authentic experience, no HD mods, using the controller. And yeah, the aiming the first few hours, you're like, man, what what is happening here? But it is a thing that I think by the end, you kind of, I don't know if your brain adapts, you just kind of get used to it. And I've always thought that, um, or I've not always thought, I've always heard that the controls were not as good as people remember. And I've always wondered with people that, you know, swear by this game. And I think that it is a good game for sure. But I think there is some rose tinted glasses looking back, particularly in the control department. I dabbled in the Wii version, just kind of to the village part, because I wanted to see what the pointer controls were all about. And I'm so, they were way better than control wise. Oh yeah. Than the dual sense or anything like that. I was, I wish I could have played with those controls, but in a prettier way, you know, it just, right. I don't understand how these modern HD ports haven't updated at least control scheme options or something. Cause it just feels so stilted. I wonder what the process would be like to add the motion controls from the Wii version to like a switch version, because the switch does have those same elements in it that you could use with the joy con. And I'm again, the ports they've made of this game over the years have been 
fairly lazy, honestly. Like even the PS4 version, it straight up doesn't have subtitles unless you are, uh, and right. unless it's not the English version. <laughs> and then they put subtitles up, and if it's uh, in a different language, which is truly strange. Um, I mean, I guess that makes sense, but it's still weird that there's just they did the subtitle work, but then they don't include it in the English release of the game. So like, yeah, the the ports of this game over the years have been incredibly bad which is funny because again now they're remaking it and so they're trying to rectify those things but yeah it is strange that this game has continued to be so fond in the i in the minds of many even though capcom hasn't really done too much to continue cementing its legacy it feels it feels like an old game by many standards um but yeah there, there's more they could have done with the various ports over the years talking about the game itself a a little less broadly i did want to start naturally with the opening of the game because i think that's one of the best parts of the game overall is just slowly entering the village and those first couple hours even though you are trying to wrap your brain around the controls and that's kind of sticking out i i think the opening and just entering the village and first coming across the what is it the las plagas uh the zombies or whatever you i'll just call them zombies the rest of the time because it's easy uh coming across all of them and getting used to how the combat's going to work in this game I, I think that is very much one of the stronger aspects of resident evil 4 as a whole and i feel like the rest i wish the rest of the game would have kept up some of the tonal elements that are seen there in the early hours because it is very eerie and it's very haunting in some ways and the later the later aspects of the game go towards more towards campiness at times which i like because i feel like that's very much a core feature of the resident evil series as well but i do like this the way that this game gets off the ground and i wish it would have leaned into that a little bit more at times how how did you guys feel about the opening i feel like uh one of the best parts about the opening is getting reintroduced i guess to leon and it's funny because i was what i was thinking about it maybe i'm totally wrong about this but Thinking about, well, since this game came out in what year? 2003? Oh, no, five. Okay. Mm-hmm. So 2005, that's kind of in the era where you have, like, emo as a thing and, like, I don't know, like, sad boy type characters. And Leon definitely kind of has a little bit of that that vibe. You know, he's been through this horrible incident and now he's, you know, in a, in a foreign country and he's got, like, you know, the cool jacket. He wears the black, you know, outfit and stuff like that. That jacket is still so and, cool. It is yeah, oh, is awesome. Definitely. And I was what's funny about it, and they're remaking it, and now this kind of I, I just was thinking about like, okay, we have like emo Bruce Wayne now in the Batman, the kind of like this like aesthetic coming back, and like Leon totally fits that like, once again, and now they're like remaking it. And uh I don't know. I don't I was trying to figure out like what is Leon is probably of the Resident Evil games, like the coolest character to me. And I don't really know what it is about him that makes him so cool. Like, I I don't know. Like, he's not like a big tough guy like like Chris is, but he's like very capable at the same time. And I I don't know. He's super cool. He's suave, kind of like he just strolls in and shoots things around, has cheesy, cheesy one liners. Gosh, you could probably fill a book with just his one-liners from the game. He yeah. just, yeah, he just has a cool edge. He's he works for the president somehow. We we go from rookie cop day one in zombie outbreak town to I am the sole operator to save the president's daughter in Spain. Something happened between two and four. They're not sending in the seals. They're not sending in the mil. They're sending in Leon S. Kennedy. Yeah, to and I think that adds to his coolness. <laughs> and the way he sits in the back of the car and the cops are talking to him and stuff, it's, I'm too cool for you. Here, I'll help a dog. And then he, yeah. you know, he he rolls and leaps out of buildings and cool. It's just, he just does cool things. Dude, it's the roundhouse kick. Uh, like yeah. that, that uh, he just consistently, and jumping out, like, yeah, you mentioned the jumping out of windows. That was something that when I was replaying, I was like, oh yeah. He's like always jumping out of stuff kicking stuff and it's interesting too just comparing this to the previous resident evil games and it's weird because this resident evil 4 is clearly the one that fans love the most but in some ways you can kind of view it as the 
the beginning of the dark times of Resident yeah, Evil because it, absolutely, yeah, this is when um, the games primarily became an action games over um, survival horror, which there's still some of that in here, but um, yeah, it, it was weird. This was a turning point for the series that was really good, but the two games after were too much in that turning point. I've one of the things I wrote down was what makes this a Resident Evil game. It kind of it lacks the B horror, I think, to a certain degree, and the obtuse puzzles. There's no really challenging puzzle in this game. And zombies, I know Logan, you said you're gonna call them zombies. It's not zombies, it's like a mind control yeah. parasite. And there's bugs now, invisible bugs. Like we've traded zombies for and wolves for bugs and mind control. And we went way into action. And so what makes this Resident Evil? Leon? Ada? Sort of. They they throw a lot of things out the window. Like that's, I, I think the reason why people do like this game so much is because it kind of stands on its own. It's called Resident Evil 4, but it really has nothing to do with the games that came before it. Umbrella's not a presence much at all. Uh, Wesker, who is the ongoing bad guy, is not in this game. Uh, I mean, this game even takes place after Code Veronica, which has a lot of crazy narrative stuff going on, and then it just tables all of that until Resident Evil 5. So, like, there's a ton of lingering plot threads that they could have poked at here in Resident Evil 4 that they just blatantly chose not to. Um, and I think that's one thing that helps the game stand out, and one thing that makes it still feel easy to go back to is that it doesn't have this lore backstory that you need to know other than just oh here's this guy leon he's yeah he's from the previous games but there's not much you need to really know about him that being said i do think it is very funny and we mentioned it that they decide to table all of this uh backstory and lore from the previous resident evil games and they're like well let's start over what is the core of this game that we can make it about let's make it uh leon saving the president's daughter it's just the most outlandish thing they could have come up with and obviously that leads to other things and there's new villains that show up and new viruses and stuff but it is it is funny that they chose not to go off and use an offshoot of one of the previous games some of the narrative threads that may have been placed there and they just kind of go in a completely different direction and then obviously they tie it all back in uh later on uh i wanted to talk about some of the other characters with you guys outside of leon though we've got uh, Ada is the big returning character in this game from the previous installments, which I don't know how much we have. I don't have a lot to say about her personally. I, I guess specifically, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to hone in on the villains though, um, because I think one of this game's rough spots when it does come to the story and characters is the villains. Uh, the the antagonists are far weaker in this game than I feel like I remembered. I like Salazar because he again is so outlandish and absurd of a character and i was greatly interested in seeing how they would go about implementing him in remake and they kind of teased him in the most recent trailer for the game that i, I think we saw about a week ago so that was fun uh but yeah this napoleon looking little boy is one of the big villains of the game and he's probably the most i guess the final villain i can't remember his name the final boss of the game i don't know if either of you guys I mean, uh it. it's He's he's throughout the entire game, but I feel like Salazar has the greatest presence. Sadler, Sad Sadler, that's, that's right. It. Yeah, I feel like he has Salazar has the greatest presence throughout the game. Uh, he's the one that I feel like the game centers around the most more often than not. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, I'd say there's what three or four main villains. There's Sadler. There's Salazar. Mm -hmm. There's uh, what's Mendez, his former partner? The tall yeah. guy. Yeah, Mendez. And then what's uh, his former partner's name? Krauser. Krauser. Those are about the four main bad guys in the game. Where Krauser, did Krauser I, come from? That's a good question. Maybe we can. Krauser talk. was made up for this game, right? Because yeah. he looks straight up like a Vulcan from Metal Gear Solid Three. I does. was, I was like, and this came out after Metal Gear Solid Three. Just saying, you know, it's like I'm getting major Vulcan vibes from this guy. Um, I didn't know if I was supposed to know him because he knows Ada and Wesker, but I don't and remember he has him a backstory in two or three. With Leon. So it just felt like they made up, which I mean, is fine. Make up backstory and stuff for your characters. But it did, it felt like I should know him and I had no idea. Well, he comes about so late too. His inclusion is 
I think he arrives like near the end of the four. There's five chapters in the game, and I think he doesn't show up until like the end of the fourth. I want to say, and they're just so. they yeah they just present him as this person you're supposed to know from Leon's past, and you really don't. And then some of his moments in the game, like I think of the uh, the big QTE sequence, which happens, which is not thrilling by any means. Um, and that's like one of the only boss fights that you really have a big uh, QTE. Uh, section with i don't know what did you guys guys have any strong or uh positive or negative feelings about the antagonists in the game because i really felt that they were quite flat especially compared to some of the other villains in the previous resident evil games which i think is more often than not a strength of the series one of the things about sadler that kind of took me out of it was i'm pretty sure that guy is one of the main voices in skyrim <laughs> um, and he sounds exactly like all the Nords in Skyrim. About. Yeah, and I was like, mm, "Take an arrow to the knee." Like that's seriously when I heard him talk. Like it made me laugh for a second. I was like, "Oh, it's that guy." Um, you, something about the villains. It's weird. Like there's the I thought that the coolest villain, villain, which I also can't remember his name, is the guy that's the the leader of the village. Like the guy in the big trench coat from the beginning that that injects you with the the parasite. I thought he was cool, and then he, once you're done with the village, he's kind of out. Like, you take him out. Um, it's almost like, I guess, each section, I guess, would have its own villain with um, uh, the the Napoleon guy being the the villain of the castle area, and then ending with Sadler and the, the QTE fight that you were mentioning. But, yeah, the thing about Ada, too, and I think what was funny about this game overall is that I... I played through it all, and then earlier today, I watched like one of those recap videos with all the the story and stuff, and I was like, man, there's how did I not... I don't know if there were certain things I didn't pick up and read, but the way they connected some of the stuff, like, oh, Ada's working for this person, they're trying to get the virus. Uh, she, well, she's working for Wesker, she right? For Wesker, and they're trying yeah. to get the they're trying to get all the viruses for Resident Evil, which is then led into Resident Evil 5 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But hmm. it's weird, because this game, it's not like... It's very upfront with its story. It has cutscenes. It's not cryptic or anything. But a lot of the lore details are hidden behind notes and stuff listed, like beside like a checkpoint or save point or something like that. It was weird just because I felt like some of this stuff is really interesting. And I wish that it was integrated into the story in a more meaningful way than reading a piece of paper. But that's not really anything new, I guess, for Resident Evil, like thinking about, uh, Resident Evil Village, a lot of the lore at the end is connected through stuff that you read. Yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting. And they did the same thing in 7, too. There's like a little lab you go through in the mines in 7. And right. And suddenly everything's connected to Umbrella out of, you know, out of nowhere, which was the point, I guess, in 7. Did either of you play the Ada mission stuff, uh, Separate Ways and something else? I forget the other name of it. I dabbled. I did not. I've, I've I been meaning it. to, but I just have not had time i thought i thought that was kind of interesting that they add that stuff later she doesn't really play any different it's the same thing she's just in an ada skin so i wonder if some of the lore stuff is i didn't finish it but i wonder if some of that's explored there as well possibly i'm not i'm not quite sure yeah and one of those offshoots i know um i think it's the shorter one of the two there's one that takes about i want to say like 30 minutes to beat and run through and it's more of like a gauntlet style mission where you've just got a bunch of foes coming at you at once and you got to get through them mercenaries all. uh i don't think it's mercenaries it's one of the it might be the ada's mission because there's one i think separate ways is the one that's like a full new chapter of the game and then there yeah. is ada's mission which i think is like her trying to escape the island and, island and exfiltrate and i believe when you get to the end of that one she hops on a helicopter and there's a brief cut scene of her talking to wesker and so Wesker does make an appearance in this game somewhat briefly, and that kind of sets the stage for Resident Evil 5. Um, so there is some larger storytelling threads that do come up in this game. But yeah, they're hidden away in some fascinating ways. Like It's like they were trying to be very intentional with making this game feel like its own thing. Did you play separate ways by chance, Max? That uh, according to the Wikipedia page, that is the larger edition. I played two chapters yeah. of that, so that had me going through the village area again, kind mm -hmm. of go down, and you kind of see what's happening to Leon and Luis while Ada's running around doing whatever Ada does. So I didn't finish it, 
but I got to play a little bit. It's interesting. It's more challenging, I think, which makes sense. It's an add-on for you're supposed to play after you play the game, so you should be pretty familiar with it at that point. It's cool to play as Ada, you know? It makes sense. Yeah. I like the inclusion of the DLC and stuff there, which I think 5 and 6 also have DLC if the boxes and stuff are anything to indicate that. So I, I'm noticing... That Resident Evil has a history of adding one-off stories and DLC and stuff. Because you talked to Logan about in 7, how there's the whole thing in the mines with Chris. And that explains what happens to Jason, the son, whatever his no, name was. No, it's not Jason. It's, uh, I can't remember. But yeah, anyway. the, uh, Lucas is his name. Lucas. So yeah, Lucas Baker. It's interesting. It was cool, but it wasn't compelling enough for me to keep playing it, I, sh- I guess I should say. Because I felt like I had had enough at that point. I mean, speaking more directly to the remake, it is one of those things that I wonder if Capcom is going to look to uh, remake as well, like the Ada campaign and uh, the the secondary modes that were part of this game, because that is something that they did in the Resident Evil 2 remake. They brought back the uh, the mission with Tofu and uh, what's the other person's name? Hunk? Is it Hunk? I think. Uh, that think sort so. of that sort of gauntlet style mission where you're trying to get out of Raccoon City and you're killing all the zombies that are in your way uh they they remade some of those i'm wondering if they'll do the same thing with the ada campaigns here possibly they did not remake them for the vr version so they didn't okay well no, armature did not so hmm. i mean it's all it's possible that they could maybe that's what the psvr2 part of resident evil 4 is because they've teased something is happening there so maybe there's and Ada, that Ada stuff is the VR part, a smaller scope without being the whole game in VR. I don't know if there's any contractual issues there. Having... I don't know if the gamers would like that. I feel like they're going to want to look at Ada while they play the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, mm-hmm. that's especially with the dress and everything. I've, yeah, I'm sure people would complain about that. I've, I've already seen complaints about how she, you know, looks like Ada. So. <laughs> While we're talking about characters a little bit, um, I did want to, Max, I think you mentioned Luis. Uh, we've not yeah. talked about Luis and Ashley too much, who I feel like are the two other uh, main protagonists of the game. And I guess Hunnigan too is sort of there and then she's not there and then she comes back in at the 11th hour. Um, Ashley, I feel like gets a lot of hate in this game and she is pretty darn annoying, but I didn't find yeah. her to be that bad throughout this game since she i mean she's supposed to be a kid i feel like most of how she's written and acts in the game would be the actions of an annoying what like president 16 year old yeah a a, Mm -hmm. a wealthy 16 year old teenage brat who's put into this situation and it is hammed up a bit but i didn't think it was too over the top If if i do have a bone to pick with any character though it would be luis i feel like he just kind of doesn't serve much of a purpose and then is unceremoniously killed kind of out of nowhere uh i think a lot of the cool lore backstory stuff that dustin's talking about Luis's whole backstory is told in memos how yes. he's in there like figuring out i wish that was explored a bit more he has some relationship with ada i think that's actually where i stopped in separate ways as they meet outside of that barn when all the villagers rush you in there so he kind of is just a weird crazy man who hits on women and then all of a sudden dies with the giant insect thing through his chest so i feel like there's more potential to explore him but he's just kind of there what's funny about ashley is that so uh in the end there's the part i'm trying to remember she like basically straight up hits on leon (laughs) which she kind of does throughout the game i'm like this is weird Mm -hmm. and i looked it up apparent according to the capcom fandom it says she's 20 years old but I'm wondering if that's one of those situations where afterwards, like, oh, yeah, 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 she's 20. She's 20. It's like, <laughs> mm, I don't know about that. But I I, I expected Ashley. <laughs> yeah. I expected it to be way more annoying also just because you. that's one of the things about this game is you hear about, like, oh, taking care of Ashley so annoying. I think in... um. Uh, when they were making Bioshock Infinite, Ken Levine talked about Ashley being like an inspiration for um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, but they wanted specifically her to not be annoying. That instead of having to protect her, she helps you out. Uh, so 
I expected it to be way worse because of hearing things like that. And then overall, I mean, yeah, she can be annoying, but for the most part, they seem to do a good job where you can like she can hide in a box if during yeah. like a, an intense combat part and then if she gets picked up or something you can pretty easily get her back but um i do feel though despite that there would be the sections where you would play and she would follow you around anytime she got taken away i was like oh thank you like i just don't even want to think about it like i get what the intent was but it i think ultimately is more annoying than than fun to have her around yeah, she. It never felt like an escort mission. I guess they designed at least that part of it, where I didn't feel like I was telling her to follow or stop too much. And when I did, it was just stop at the bottom of these stairs while I go deal with stuff, and then I'll come back and or I'll tell you to come follow me. I, so I think they did a good job of having her stick to you fairly well and not be too annoying in that regard. She's mostly annoying i guess in the scenarios where she is being kidnapped or in she's got to go spin the lever or lift the lever or she's stuck down below and you have to snipe to save her but that's just gameplay scenarios not so much the moment to moment with her following you around so the thing about ashley and leon i guess is they're both infected with the las plagas but that never feels like a threat at all there's they cough blood once, but there's this pressure of if you don't do it, you'll turn into a mind controlled thing. And I guess Ashley is mind controlled by Sadler there for a moment at the end. But this plot thread of you will turn into one of the villagers didn't feel like it had any weight to it. And so it kind of removed, I think, some tension there, especially with the whole plot being we're going to infect the daughter ship her back to the United States and then control the president. That's such just, a good, that's such a good <laughs> an idea. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we'll just kidnap the president's daughter. No one will think anything about it and we'll ship her right back. And yeah, <laughs> no one will think twice about what we did in that yeah. in between <laughs> time. Yeah. I, I didn't, I don't think she's, I, I didn't think of her as an escort mission either. And I think a lot of that is because you can, tell her to hide in certain places and then call you can call her from anywhere on the given map or level or whatever where you're at which i think is really nice because a lot of games from that era you have to go like physically approach the person that you are escorting and like do a manual prompt right when you're right next to them it's kind of like a horse in breath of the wild like you whistle and it just shows up like she kind of just (laughs) not to say ashley's a horse but she those mechanics at least are on the appealing side instead of uh, being too fetch questy. Yeah, I didn't find it to be that cumbersome, to be honest. I do agree with you, though, with what you were saying about uh, her and Leon and how there never feels to be any sort of stress within the story of the game. I mean, it, it's beat over your head a lot that, oh, Leon's infected and so is Ashley, and you have to, you're racing against the clock, but there never feels like there's any sort of stakes in that regard, and that instead you're more preoccupied with just fighting off the enemies that are directly in front of you and facing giant trolls and fish monsters and whatever the heck else you run across on this uh, island, or I guess not an island, but wherever country. Could be a part of it. This hidden part of Spain. <laughs> it looks like the yeah. remake is, I, I feel like everything we talk about here, I'm going to naturally like point to the remake and say, oh, what's it's hard this in to. this game? Yeah, it is very hard not to. I, I feel like the remake, that's one of the things they could do in the game that could make it that could make its storyline a little bit more compelling is to lean into those moments where they're where they are show just how they are infected, not maybe through gameplay. I don't know what that would look like. I guess I don't want like a far cry two situation where you're trying to pop pills every two seconds and your vision's getting blurry and stuff. But yeah, th- there's probably some interesting gameplay things that and story things they could do in the remake with that idea. And I think it is one of the more interesting aspects of the game story, but it's just, it's just kind of there, and they they don't ever do anything with it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I would lo- I would love to see that changed in the future. Before we get, I, there's a lot of like mechanical things I want to talk about with this game, and a lot of things that I think are very influential and some core Resident Evil staples. We'll get to that in a second, though. Um, I do want to talk about the various areas in the game and kind of how the game is segmented. And we've talked about the opening village that makes up the first chapter or so of the game. 
uh, and then there's the lake and the castle and then you get the final island that you're on and stuff like that. I guess just broadly, what was your guys' favorite part of the game? Uh, did you have a, any 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 favorite area, any least favorite area? And how did you feel like the game fro- flowed from one space uh, to the next? Because if there is any one thing I do want to give this game a lot of credit for, it's that its pacing is pretty stellar. Like this game keeps things going. I, I never felt like there was a lull at any point in this game. Max is shaking your head, and so I would love to hear what you think the lull is in the game. Are the castles too long? No, oh, but that's the best part of the game, I think. It's yeah. too long. Well, it's that or drop the island. It's too long. The castle is, it's a long stretch. And I don't know. I just didn't want to be in there anymore after a while. You didn't it's like okay. Salazar? You didn't like talking to him on your uh, Metal Gear Codex, which is <laughs> just a blatant ripoff? Yes, it was. I, I did write that down. I said, when did we get uh, Metal Gear Solid vibes with the calls? I just think the castle's too long. Like you get, you get the present, you get Ashley and you go, you hide in the castle and then the flow was move through the castle. Then you're separated from her. Then Louise dies. You're finding your way to Ashley. You get her back. You play as Ashley for a little bit. You run through, there's the sewers with the bugs. Then there's the sewers again with the second in command. And then the tower at the, at least, this castle just never stops, and there's a, a rail car or oh, yeah. whatever you call it. With this, it's just there's Mine a lot cart. of parts that make up a castle, and I just kind of felt like we did the castle thing pretty good, and it just didn't stop. And if that kills the pacing, I think for me, especially if we're going to keep bouncing around. I don't know. In some ways, I feel like I can agree that the ca- the castle at, at some points I feel like does feel a little long. But I do feel like the castle feels the most traditional Resident Evil part mm. of the game. And I think for me, I think that's what makes it my favorite part is just the different environments, the 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 creepy paintings. I think the enemies with the hoods and stuff like that are yeah. are really cool in the castle. It's the thing that was has been interesting in playing through all the Resident Evil games, and I've played uh seven and I've played Village, is that they all seem to have like a similar final act problem where mm-hmm. you're in some kind of dingy lab, uh, le- le- less so on village, but like, or some kind of dingy, more industrial environment that just gets old way quicker than the other environments like the island. I don't know. It's not even that it's that hard to to navigate. There's like the one section where you kind of have to backtrace in order to get the different key cards and stuff, but um, I just from a visual perspective, I thought that the island was the the least interesting part. Um, yeah. The and I think that again, gravitating to talking about the remake again, is that I think that that's one of going to be probably one of the ways that they can really improve on this game overall. Is that this game is already set up for the new? I guess comparing it to Village, it can be set up kind of in the same way as Village, where. There's the castle part, there's the dollhouse, there's the section at the end, and they're kind of all like these, I don't want to say miniature open worlds, but miniature levels with each containing puzzles and separate enemies and stuff like that. There's like, it's easily expand upon where you can do like a a village section that has more puzzles, more enemies, whatever, um, and then moving on to the castle where you can have tons more puzzles and stuff like that, and more... I guess the main thing that would make this game more Resident Evil like is getting items and unlocking different areas, kind of like that Metroidvania style aspect where you can unlock and backtrace throughout the castle. I think that's one of the most interesting aspects that they can improve on for that remake. Yeah, the castle was my favorite for a lot of the same reasons you said, Dustin. It it felt inherently Resident Evil. I, I think that I think a lot of the horror vibes, like I mentioned, were up front with the village. Um, and then those sort of drop in the castle, but it, it, it then becomes more Resident Evil in terms of like iconography and stuff like that with the setting that you're in. And you mentioned the people in, uh, I guess the hooded robed people aren't necessarily classic Resident Evil per se, because the games up until this point had largely just been in Raccoon City. But it feels very much part of this world at the same time, and it feels entrenched within what resident evil is and so i it feels it's like the coziest part of the game to me uh and yes i think it does take a long time to get through max but i guess conversely like i 
it's the part of the game I like the most. I'm fine with it being a little bit longer. Mm. Also, I will say, I think it does a good job of mixing up the spaces that you're in within the castle. Like you gave a rundown of everything that happens from start to finish within the castle. I mean, I don't think you can and deny that there's some at, stuff too. Yeah. I don't think you can de- deny that there's at least a ton of variety o- over that oh, sp- yeah, span of sure. time. Like it's not just castle corridors that you're running through and killing enemies mindlessly. Like they're, they're constantly putting new things in front of you. And uh, I do like the backtracking aspects of it because it, it kind of keeps you thinking about, well, I can't access this over here. How am I going to do that later? And the game is, for the most part, pretty linear. So you are going to come across every offshoot path on your own throughout the course of the game. Um, so in that regard, there's really nothing, there's really no like discoverability in the game. There's really nothing that you need to do uh, that the game isn't going to do for you as long as you play it to completion, which is, again, one thing that I think they could improve on in the remake. Um yeah. But yeah, the castle is the area that I like the most. And conversely, the part that I dislike the most is the island, (laughs) similar to Dustin. I think the reason I don't like that is because it just feels like it's... The game is very much bottlenecking towards the end. And so they, they need to they need to condense some things down but at the same time then they introduce krauser who feels totally out of place and there's an entire boss fight there with him um and i actually like that fight not the qte one but the one where he's sniping you and you have to run up the tower and stuff and then you fight him up on the deck i I think that's a pretty fun fight overall um is one of the better boss fights in the game and we can talk about bosses here uh, in a bit, that's one thing I want to do. Other than that, though, I think the other thing about the island I, that I really dislike and that stands out to me a lot is the sequence with the helicopter. That feels totally <laughs> not yeah. Resident Evil at that's all. That's the action over the top part. Yeah, it's just I I don't even know why you have to fight your way through. It feels like you should just walk through to the end because yeah. the helicopter just kills pretty much everyone in front of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it. It was whatever. And then it just blows up unceremoniously at the end. Yes. Dude, that's a good part, though, because that's one of the my favorite parts where the, the helicopter blows up and, and Leon's like, Mike! And it's like, <laughs> who's, who, who's Mike? <laughs> <This guy. laughs> uh, I will say about the island, at least the start of the island is scary again. When you don't know how to kill the regenerators... Oh yeah, yeah. And you're in this lab and you you have to figure out your way through it and you need key cards. That feels Resident Evil to me. And then they give you a thermal scope and you the regenerators are not a problem at all. I will say though, when I played that the first time in VR, I did not get the thermal scope. I just never opened that box, so I couldn't kill regenerators. And so I was actually very scared of them each time they showed up. So I do appreciate at least them dabbling back with the horror after such a long actiony portion of the game. I mean, there's even an offshoot in the castle where you do like fight things in a lava room. Like there's just yeah. a lava room in the castle. So I like going back to horror, but it quickly goes back to the action with the, the helicopter and the fights and all that stuff. So I like the scary stuff. I, the labs are another thing and another part of that island section, but it does feel intrinsically resident evil i anytime there's a lab section in any of these games i feel like it's just it has to happen like it's part of a resident evil quota that capcom puts in place or something like oh we got to put a laboratory section in place so we can explain where all these zombies and uh, mutants and monsters came from so that part of the game i i did enjoy but once it yeah it gets more to the helicopter type stuff wasn't my favorite i do want to give a shout out to the lake section though um because it feels wholly unique compared to everything else like the village stuff i think there's similar vibes you can get in other games the lake i feel like is the most different part of this game for both better and worse because this is also the section where you get trolls coming and attacking you which doesn't make a whole lot of sense but you know sure but there's Um, also a giant alligator fish thing yes and you gotta throw hooks at it (laughs) a giant uh spears at it or whatever and and at this point in resident evil giant monsters really weren't a thing outside of nemesis right uh like huge for the most part for the most part i believe but i can't remember what's in code veronica honestly so well i haven't played that one yet that's coming up 
Me neither. Yeah, I don't know. Did you guys have anything to say about the lake in particular that stood out other than maybe the bosses and stuff like that that are at this point? I will say that I do appreciate that uh, speaking about the lake and some of the different bosses or I guess almost just sections that this game does do creative things here and there that I I some like specifically thinking about either the 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 battle with the the fish monster in the lake whatever that thing is 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 kind of an interesting thing that you don't do anything like that in the rest of the game the part when you're held up in the house uh taking on this you know the hordes of enemies for as you know minutes at a time yeah and then there's the mine cart section all of those are really interesting ideas and I'm glad they're in the game. Some of them, particularly the minecart one, I was getting really frustrated with. I was like, this is cool. I, it's, if we're going to do action stuff, it might as, might as well be stupid and over the top. But it, I was, man, I was just getting so frustrated with that part. Like, I think I had to do that part like three or four different times. I had to do that with the house. I just couldn't get through the swarm yeah. of enemies. I was watching your uh, VR stream when you were doing mm-hmm. that. Because you were streaming miserable. yourself playing that and you were getting your butt kicked. <laughs> I was getting my teeth kicked in by those zombies in that house. It was rough. I will say, though, VR bow, awesome. If, you're, if you don't get motion sick, throwing, shooting the spear gun at the giant fish thing is awesome in VR. So I definitely recommend that part of the game. There's one thing, I feel like it kind of fits here with the world because he's everywhere. We haven't talked about the shopkeeper. Oh yeah, yeah. What are you buying, character. guys? What are you buying? Well, this kind of segues well because I was going to, st- I wanted to start talking about the weapons and and also the inventory management system. So it's there you go. Thank you for setting me I up. I got some rare things on sale, stranger. Yeah, yeah, the I think it's funny that the shopkeeper is honestly the most iconic character from this game, other than Leon. Uh, I mean, more mm-hmm. so than Ashley, even I would say, is the shopkeeper. And it's because he just stands out like a sore thumb in many ways. <laughs> He's just, he is the, he is the video game aspect of this video game. It just makes no sense. There's just this guy wandering around and we're not even going to try to explain it. He's just there. There's not a whole lot you can say about him other than his voice lines are choice. The remake, I pretty sure they changed his voice. I don't know what the heck is up with that. I'm really it really bothers me. I think that's going to bother me a lot when I play that game because whoever <laughs> did the original VO for the shopkeeper in this game did an immaculate job and yeah. I want to give them massive props, whoever they are. I didn't look up their name before we did this. But yeah, the shopkeeper is great. Awesome. Yeah, I like too that he just straight up is like, yeah, I got a shooting range in this castle. You yeah, I didn't bring that up I- either. <laughs> he's got like five or six of them scattered yeah. around. I think, dude, I think he's great. And it's one of those things too... Um, where you know we're talking about camp in in resident evil and i feel like the the shopkeeper especially in this game is like just the perfect amount of that because it's one of those at the end of the game i wasn't like ah man we never found out the backstory behind the the shopkeeper but i kind (laughs) of i kind of like that he has this mystique he's got this big trench coat you're like wondering like what is he about to do when he (laughs) pulls it open like who is this guy um but yeah he's just this guy he's just trying to make a a dollar or two he's just you know small businessman making his way in um somewhere in spain <laughs> so yeah he's he's great you gotta support local businesses during this right. recession that we're in so. you, you do the voice actor is none other than paul mercer mercier who's also yeah. the voice of leon okay it's leon really leon oh yeah is- i'm seeing that right now what the leon is the merchant okay all right <laughs> well then you would think that they would be able to get him back for the remake i mean unless i am wrong i'm pretty sure the voice has changed it sounded in different remake. in the trailer it very much sounded different i don't think they've released the cast list yet for the remake but just hearing him in the trailer his accent sounded different over here stranger over here stranger I do like not only his VO and those types of things, but I like what he represents in the game. When you see the merchant, you know you're safe. There may not be a safe spot, but nothing will come hurt you while you're at the merchant. 
that is something they could play with in the remake and subvert expectations that way. Maybe have something attack you at one of them. Almost like uh, in Last of Us Part 2 when you go to one of the workbenches and all of a sudden you're assaulted by wolves. But the merchant represents safety and some sort of reprieve, but not enough. Because you can only buy one spray can of health. And if you have one already, he won't sell you another one. He doesn't sell ammo, despite having boxes of ammo behind him at some of his shops. (laughs) And he'll sell you guns and upgrades and things like that. But, uh, you know, piecemeal as you go. And then he'll sell you a more powerful gun then you're deciding, do I sell the gun I have now? It's a whole thing. So I do like what he represents mechanically as well within the game. Well, speaking of those mechanics, I think that's honestly the most influential aspect of this game is just the gun upgrade system and the invent, maybe not as much the inventory management because I think Resident Evil 4's specific style of inventory management has gone on to become infamous in its own right so much so that i know there are separate games dedicated to just like inventory management simulator i think is a game on steam where it is just literally the inventory system from resident evil 4 as its own game um so people really like how the inventory system is set up in this game and i think it still works quite well because every there were there were multiple times during my playthrough where i thought oh shoot i can't pick this up and i'm gonna have to put it down on the ground and then i just finagle some things around real fast and all of a sudden boom i've got more room in my inventory than i expected um that is something that still feels wholly fresh in this game i believe even though it's almost two decades old and as far as the like i was saying the gun upgrades and the various weapons and how you can upgrade them it's a very straightforward system but i i really do feel like it's something that we hadn't seen much before until it came about and then it was duped by so many games afterward throughout the 360 and ps3 era in particular that i'm thinking about and even nowadays like a a lot of games still do this sort of upgrade system within their games and i I don't know if resident Evil 4 necessarily created it i don't think it was probably the first maybe i'm wrong about that but it definitely popularized it and i think it's largely stood the test of time it doesn't take i like picking up coins throughout the entire game too it's it's good that you are killing things left and right in this game there's some sort of uh, immediate gratification most of the time when you do kill something that you can just pick up a little something here and there and you know that you're building up your wealth so the next time you do see the shopkeeper um, you've got some money to blow how how'd you guys feel about those elements of the game in particular i feel like in connection to that just overall the economy of the game as far as like how much money you're pulling in is never Like, it's enough that you feel like every time you see the shopkeeper, it's like, okay, I'm definitely going to be able to at least buy a few, buy a new weapon or at least upgrade something. But it's never, you're never swimming in cash in this game. Mm -hmm. And that's like the nice balance is that like by the end, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting too thinking about the weapons just because with the inventory, you have to be very selective about which weapons you choose to, to use because you just simply cannot hold all of them at once and so for me it was interesting just thinking about there's like what four different pistols in this game and so i did cheat a little bit and look online and be like okay what is actually like it tells you the differences but it's like do one (laughs) of these suck like i don't want to necessarily sell what i have in order to get this gun that's that's not very good or something like that but i do as that that little bit of of tension of figuring out like okay uh do if I buy this weapon, then I won't have the room. Should I wait to buy that weapon until I have a bigger case? Stuff like that, which it's interesting just because it does tie into traditional Resident Evil, which is about you know a lot of inventory management stuff, just kind of in a new, unique way. And I'm really glad seeing that they're continuing that on for the remake as well. I think... About the inventory specifically, that's one thing, another thing that I had always heard about in Resident Evil, even though I hadn't played it, was the inventory system's dope. I love it. It's the best. Bring it back. Now, I don't know if it does leave in five and six. Seven has a taste of it. You don't get to control the orientation of items below. Um, They automatically flip and flop. But I do know that when Village came out, people were stoked that the inventory system is very similar to Resident Evil 4. So I do know 
that's a big deal. And I like it. I like moving and organizing things. Who who doesn't? I could totally see a simulator game being something on Steam that people like. If a power washing game can become one of the top games on Game Pass, I'm sure there's a organization simulator out there for moving items in a case. This feels like, and in, I've heard it discussed as such, uh, but could be wrong with time and all that stuff, but this feels like the start of a lot of modern conventions in third-person action shooting games. It Not only that perspective and just shooting over the shoulder and all that stuff. Look at every major single-player first-party game now. Uh, if you just look at Sony, it's God of War, The Last of Us, Ghost of Zeus. You know, it's all behind you, over-the-shoulder stuff. Inventory management, that's a huge deal in a lot of games. Maybe not as intricate and sometimes gets a little bloated in other games. But it's it kind of made it popular. It made it, This brought it all to the forefront and made it the modern standard, I feel like. One thing I wanted to hone in on with this specifically was what you said, Dustin, about how uh, you were trying to decide which guns to get and which ones not to get. How did you guys eventually decide to play through the game? Because I guess for me specifically, I, once I got like halfway through the game, I realized I had been upgrading a lot of guns that I had had on me for a bit. And I just decided to see through those upgrades fully rather than because when you buy a new shotgun, you don't want to you in turn are going to get rid of the one that you've been carrying with you because you don't want to carry two shotguns with you. It's kind of a huge waste. So you're only going to carry one pistol with you at a time, one shotgun with you, maybe the Magnum and then RPG or something like that if you can carry it or a machine gun. Personally, uh, I got about halfway through the game and I just decided to see through my upgrades for a lot of the guns I did have on me, even though the game was then dangling stronger weapons in front of me, uh, which I didn't know if they would be stronger or weaker. Kind of like I didn't do what you did, Dustin, which was look them up and figure out, oh, is this one going to be really stronger? I just knew I had enough money... It was like a sunk cost fallacy. Like, all right, I've already poured so much money into this. I know I could sell it and get some of that money back, but I don't want to do that. I just kind of want to finish upgrading this thing out and see how it turns out. What did you guys do there? I, I'm, I'm curious. Anytime the shop gave a new shotgun or pistol or machine gun or whatever for you to buy, did you always buy that new one and then dump the old one thinking that it would inevitably end up being better? Or how did you go about that? I immediately sold the old. <laughs> did you? And bought okay. the new. Because... Especially, I realized this late game with the Magnum in particular, because you get that fairly late anyway. But they introduced another one. I think it's called the Killer 7, which is funny because that was one of the Capcom 5. But it had like a, a hit of like 25 points. And one point is one shot from a regular pistol. And the Magnum that I had pretty much mostly maxed out was at like 17. So it was already better, and then it can go up to 35. So I would just sell it, and I realized that you got some of the money back. The more you invested, the more the gun would sell for. Not that you get all your money back, but just kept it upgraded. The only weapon I didn't care for was the mine launcher. I bought that and then sold it a few shopkeepers later. Uh, I didn't care for that at all. But I always had the pistol, the submachine gun, a shotgun, a rifle, a magnum, and then an RPG. So I had everything. You were maxed out there with weapons. Jeez. I was never yeah. I was never hurting for a weapon. Uh, initially, I was going to keep the the initial handgun for the same reason as you Logan where I was like, man, I've invested so much in this that surely it'll be because of my investment it will be better. But one of the nice things is that it does give you the actual stats. And kind of like what Max was saying, I was like, well, it's kind of stupid for me to not now that I'm looking at the stats, specifically on the pistol. But mm -hmm. I did see with the shotgun in particular, like, I'm pretty sure that each one of them are each like there's the regular shotgun, the riot gun, and then the striker, right? Yeah. Yeah. And each of them are slightly different in how they shoot, or at least between the striker and the riot gun, because I think the striker is supposed to be more of a spread than a mm -hmm, okay. than a straight on shot so the striker was one that i just i just kept the riot gun and just kept upgrading that yeah. um but i'm glad okay i'm glad to hear the mine launcher sucked because when i saw that i thought something about that tells me it's not 
going to be <laughs> it's quite what I'm looking for. So it I just totally up so much it. space and a separate ammo entirely. So you now oh, you're juggling yeah. an extra box of ammo in your case that you just don't even care for. Right. I would be uh, remiss if we didn't also talk about the RPG. And I'm curious what you guys did with the RPG and in a couple instances you may have had it. I don't know if you ever bought one from the shopkeeper. I know there's one specific part in the castle where you can earn one outright um, through a sort of side tangent puzzle or enemy encounter. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'm curious what you did with it. And I think Max and I did literally the same thing with it because we briefly spoke about this. Um, And this can maybe lead into how we talk about boss fights as well. Uh, Max, what what did you do with yours? Because I think we did the same thing. Yeah, Salazar. (laughs) I shot him with the Magnum to get him to reveal his face. And then I used the RPG and shot him in the face. And then he died. Yeah. And I did the same thing with um, Sadler at the end. And then Ada throws you another rocket launcher during that fight. So it takes two rocket launchers to kill him. That's what I did. For me, it was also Salazar. But here's the reason so we why. All did this, we all did the same exact thing with it at that time. I wasn't going to use it because I was going to save it. And then when I was playing it, he can instant kill you like pretty mm-hmm. early on in the fight. So I tried a few different times and he kept instant killing me. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves in games. And the fact that games still, there are still games today that come out that have instant kill enemies really annoys me. I was like, all right, enough. So then I just was like, it's time. And I revealed it and I used the RPG and, and took him out instantly. So I'm trying to, I might've used it on the last boss just cause I had one. I'm like, well, I bought one. So I'll use it on the last boss, which honestly kind of made it a little anticlimactic at the end. Yes. Just because it was just, practically one and done i had no idea though before i used it that it was a one hit kill essentially and (laughs) when i sent logan my i sent him a little clip of me killing salazar i thought that the magnum had contributed to his demise but i could have just done it with a regular pistol and then shot him with a rocket launcher and got the same effect so i like that there is a essentially a one hit kill weapon but it does rob a lot of tension out of boss fights and encounters when i I played Resident Evil 3 earlier this year and got the platinum and stuff in it. And part of getting that platinum is playing through the game really fast and on harder difficulties. And you can buy an infinite rocket launcher, which turns it into a very video gamey game. But it's funny, and it's like the fifth time you've beaten the game, and you just run around and you're shooting rockets everywhere. I kind of feel like that's the same thing here, but your first time through the game and it's it's like a one-hit cheat code. It feels like it shouldn't be this powerful or accessible. One or the other. Yeah, it, it, it's weird that... Uh, I think it's kind of weird that the RPG's in the game. Like, I understand it's fun to use. I'm glad it's there. It's enjoyable. I get I get a kick out of it when I when I do use it, but it feels so over-tuned. Like, I was genuinely shocked because I had forgotten that you can essentially one-hit kill bosses as well. And I we all use it on Salazar. That's really funny. And my situation yeah. was different because I was running out of ammo. And I was like, okay, well sitting on this rpg may as well use it and then boom boss fight's done salazar's dead um so none of us really experienced that boss fight as it was intended i specifically though did not use it against sadler for uh the same reasons you kind of mentioned dustin was i was like i don't want this to be a really anticlimactic end of the game i've got so much ammo for all my other guns i'm just gonna unload everything i have into this guy because i know the game is over after this point and so that's what I did. Like I said, I did want to talk about the other boss fights here, though, since we were, I felt like, naturally going to kind of discuss it. And there's really about, I want to say, like, eight to ten major bosses in the game, depending on, I guess, what you consider. I would consider the trolls uh, one, even though there's, like, multiple instances where you run across them. Um, which bosses really stood out to you guys the most, and which ones... Did you like the most? I I don't think any of us are going to have anything interesting to say about the Salazar fight. Um, but what do you think about the other bosses in the game? And uh, just generally, Max, I know you can't speak to this for yourself for in every instance, and same with you, Dustin, but how do, how do you feel like they fare compared to some of the other ones that are seen in the Resident Evil series? Hmm. Well, I'm, tr- I'm trying to remember. Let's see. Verdugo is what he's listed on this list of... He's the guy that when you're in the the basement you're waiting you have like a timer where you have to kind of have 
uh, to avoid him. Oh for yeah, a little you bit. can freeze him with. Uh, you can freeze him. Canisters. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure you can actually kill him if you actually go and freeze him multiple times. But yeah, I like can. that section just because it was like the right amount of of tension, and he's also like a really creepy design as well. I also really like the chief guy, which I'm seeing now as Chief uh, Mendez. Yeah, I think. Anyway, the guy who I like, like splits like, his spine and yeah, becomes really and tall. And that mainly just just comes from him being creepy and weird. And I liked how his uh, his overall design was super cool. Yeah, I liked him a lot. He reminded me of Mister X and Nemesis, just scope and size of him. And then, but also that Resident Evil villain classic thing where his body turns into a giant funky creature that yeah. is scary and the buildings on fire that's a really f- atmospheric and good fight feels pretty fair i uh, Sal- salzar eh sadler eh the what is i don't know what it's called but the the, the maze thing in the mines where you're running in those boxes above a cavern and you have to unlock things and giant creatures chasing you. Oh yeah. 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 I think that's a cool concept. I wish it was a bit more tense, I guess, or you kind of can just run away from it. You never have to really face the creature. And so that robs him, I guess some of the scare factor, but I think that concept is really cool being trapped in a maze, having to escape a monster. That's pretty fun. I like that guy a lot whatever it's called. I think this game is at its best in the boss fights where you don't have a lot of room to move. I think that's one of the things that undermines the Sadler fight is that he's a really dangerous enemy, but you have a bit too much space to get away with him, get away from him and go post up in a corner and shoot him with your sniper rifle or shoot him with anything really uh, for them for that matter. So I, Sadler as a final boss, I think is pretty weak. But a lot of the other ones you guys mentioned, uh, I think Menendez is a great fight because you're trapped in that barn or whatever it is that's also on fire. So it really feels like an intense, high stakes situation. You've got this dude who's been chasing after you the entire game who's now morphed into this really weird looking creature. And it it feels like it's probably one of the more stressful fights in the game. I do also think that the number two or the right hand of Salazar or whatever, Verdugo, uh, that fight is incredibly intimidating because you can just you completely skipped past him didn't you right dustin because i killed him um did you just hop on the elevator and get away from him then i think that i went and did all of what i thought was all the freeze points and he didn't die okay <laughs> so i just said I'm, okay i'm out and then just ran to the elevator at that point but i attempted to kill him so i, I must have been missing something no it takes a lot of ammo to kill him and then i think the salazar fight might be somewhat soon after that so when i said i was low on ammo for the salazar fight it might have been because i blew a lot of it on that fight it takes a bit to kill him i did mention before though i really like the krauser fight for these same sort of reasons though Mm. there's a there's a timer you so that you feel artificial pressure to kill him fast you don't have a whole lot of time to figure out how you're supposed to beat him you just have to you have to do it very quickly or else you're going to die there um, either his hand or from the explosion. And then you are in a very tight space where you don't have a whole lot of time to think. And when you're in that tighter space, you really can't use all your weapons. Like I think any of the boss fights where you're allowed to use your rifle, which I found to be one of the stronger uh, weapons in the entirety of Resident Evil 4, really made the boss fights that much less intense. Like I didn't have a whole lot of problem with the various trolls or whatever they're called that you would come across throughout the game because I was always just popping him in the head with my rifle from a corner I would go and run into. Uh, Krauser is a good fight because he stays right on top of you the whole time. And while I think he is a terrible, terrible character within this game, uh, that fight itself is pretty strong, in my opinion. I think it is one of the... I think it does help close the game on a strong note in that regard. I really stupidly... I had to do that fight twice because I beat him and there's the timer... And so then it plays the cutscene, and the cutscene ended, and someone had texted me. So I, I was like, "Oh, the boss fight's over." I watched the cutscene, and I picked up my phone, and then like it blew up. Still, I was like, "Oh yeah, there was a giant bomb attached to where I'm standing." <laughs> so I ended up doing that fight twice, and then uh, successfully got away the second time. But that was funny. That happened to me, but with the cutscene with Krauser in the night fight, I was like, "It's a cutscene." Oh, yeah. I'll just grab my phone, and then he killed you. Mm-hmm. 
we haven't talked about the QTEs at all, just because this is one of those things that is definitely kind of more of that era. Not that we don't have QTEs at all anymore, but very specifically these these cutscene QTEs. Yeah. Just because I think that we're all kind of tuned now at this point, and not for the better, to like, I don't know. I'll pay attention for the most part in cutscenes for games, but every once in a while, like you'll just like, you know, take a look at your phone, see if anyone texts you or something like that. And you can't do that in this game because they will throw you a, a, a QTE like at any point without even realizing. That's one thing that I don't, I was never a fan of, of QTEs. Like that's one of the things I don't like about like the early God of War games and stuff okay. like that. I just don't find them that compelling as a game mechanic. So like, I don't know especially the parts too in this game where you have to quick like he's like running and if you tap really fast it almost looks like he's like cartoonishly running really fast yeah from the just boulders an, and stuff yeah yeah it's an interesting relic of that time yeah i'm not a fan of them i actually found out later that you there's a setting in uh, the vr version to completely remove the qtes from mm. cutscenes which sounds really nice and I wish I had seen that sooner, but but you it, can't uh, check your phone when you're in VR, or maybe you this can. is That's true. Know. This is true. So that problem never really. I mean, you still had to. The problem though in VR is their motion QTEs. So it's like Wii era type stuff where oh. swing your arms this way or move your arm, you know, duck, you know. So you win some, you lose some there. And then I would assume the remake has no QTEs. In cutscenes, at the very least. So um, here's to hoping, I guess. <laughs> it really is a sad indictment of how we are wired nowadays, whether it be because of social media or just having phones on us all the time, that the second cutscenes do kick in, we grab our phones. I played uh, God of War Ragnarok recently, and that is a game I have been looking forward to for about five years eagerly. And I found myself grabbing my phone during cutscenes of that game sometimes, and I'm like, what am I doing? I have been mm-hmm. dying to play this game and watch these cutscenes and see these story moments for literally years, and I'm sitting here texting somebody or scrubbing mm. through Twitter or whatever, and it's very, it's a problem. You got to put the phone away for the big games. Yes. Uh, that's what yes. I do. Like, yes. Part, I, I last ca- was I part ca- two, the phone was not next to me. The phone was in a different room. I caught myself doing it at one part late in the game, and I tossed it away very quickly um speaking of boss fights kind of in the same vein i did want to touch quickly on enemies in the game and see what you guys thought of just the basic enemies that you come across uh i think there's a good amount of variety here and even the ones that are the same throughout the game i think uh, there's at least a sort of uh, there's a visual difference between them, like the villagers, obviously, we mentioned are there in the first half of the game. And even though the Las Plagas foes are the same once you get into the castle, now they're these hooded cult-like figures. And so they're the same in theory, but they are a little bit different. Um, but there's a lot of, I think what this game does a very good job of and what makes all the encounters stand out is that they give you a good mix of a lot of different types of foes at different times. I think of one a uh, specific part of the castle where you're in like a really large expansive room and there's a ton of people coming at you at once and there's some of them who have shields and there's some of them who are just basic types and some of them have uh, like long range weapons or crossbows they can shoot you with and there's just there's a lot of things at once that you kind of have to juggle which I think is an impressive part of how these games encounters are set up um, beyond that uh, there is a good mix of just random monsters and stuff. Like you mentioned one of the sewer parts too, Max, where you're all of a sudden fighting invisible creatures. It's weird. It's out of place, but it's different. And I, I just think for a game where you are shooting people a lot in the head, um, even, even with the most basic enemy types too, like you can kill one of the stressors about this game to me is that you can headshot people and then their heads pop off and you're like, yeah, they're dead. Awesome. And then one of the Las Plagas parasites pops right out and you're like, no, now I got to deal with this. And like, there's a lot of variations and a lot of different factors that you are constantly juggling at any given point in these fights. And I think it really uh, is one of the game's stronger elements combined with the various weapons that you can use. I really like the, uh, the chainsaw guy, which I'm looking up yeah. and his name is, everyone's listing him as Dr. Salvador, which is that like a fan name that they've given him? Or is, is there any reference to this being his name? Which there's multiple Dr. Salvadors in the game. But I think it's a nice way that 
a lot of the enemy, especially later on, you can kind of like really blast through enemies pretty fast if you have powerful weapons. Uh-huh. But when you hear that chainsaw, you're like, oh no, okay, here we go. Like, brace yourself, get your shotgun out because this is going to definitely add a foil, even if there are, especially with a bunch of other enemies. So his name, Dr. Sal- Salvador, comes from his bottle cap, which is the thing that you can win from uh, the shooting range missions that the shopkeeper oh. gives you. I don't know. Did you guys do all the shooting range stuff by chance? I got every bottle cap in the game because I am an insane person. And also I wanted mm. the trophy for it because I have a problem. But I I tr- I tried out the shooting range, but I didn't. I like did the first one and I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, they're not great. So you don't need to do yeah. that. I, I did it in VR because that's that seems like the perfect type of place for a VR game. I did not do it in the normal version. I didn't know it would come from the bottle cap. I actually just looked up the... The GameCube manual. I thought maybe there'd be like a character page and it would list that because that's kind of an old thing. And Cap Capcom just has the manual scanned and the box art and stuff from the GameCube version. So props on Capcom for mm. providing high quality PDFs of uh, old manuals. Props to them. There's an ad for the uh, chainsaw controller and Resident Evil Apocalypse, nice. which has a uh, the main lady in a towel and then also in like a mesh armor suit so definitely is is that one of the movies yeah one of the movies so okay it's just oh it's uh the soundtrack is there we can listen to slipknot a perfect circle the cure deftones rob zombie the used a lot of stuff (laughs) this is all out of your realm max i have no idea Uh, the only one i recognized there was a slipknot so and the cure we made you listen to the cure Oh, that band Mario had me listen to that I didn't like. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Did you have anything you want to say about the enemies or anything like that, Max? I know you were going to. Oh, yeah. Uh, I felt like they were all the same. <laughs> the really? village people are just the hooded people, which are just the military people. The big guys are the big guys. I liked the ones that stand out. The Wolverine bum rush guys. They were oh, those are great. interesting to fight. Yeah, they're fun. Uh, the wolves were in there for a little bit, felt a little out of place, especially since you help a wolf early on and then that helps you in a fight, but then wolves, other wolves will come and try and kill you anyway. So that felt a little weird. The ogres are interesting. I like the fight with the two ogres and you can time it and try and get one or both of them in the lava in the middle there. That's a fun fight. I thought, but the regular, regular enemies, I was bored bored with them because i knew they were just reskinned i'm surprised to hear that so even even though like i said there's a lot of variation with them and they have different weapons is and it the parasites can jump there's out one of them that and walks stuff. there's one with a shield some get a chain ball and but chain. you need to kind of it's kind of like uh eh, maybe this is giving it too much credit i it's, it's kind of like doom eternal i feel like certain weapons have certain benefits against certain enemy types that you want to like oh i see a shield guy i want to pull out my rifle because i know my rifle can penetrate that shield way more quickly than i can oh i never did that i just shot him in the foot well, i shoot him with the smg i guess in the on the ps4 just okay through the shield i i kind of use that gun a lot whenever you I use that so you were an smg user that is the one weapon i did not use at all Surprise. i love really? that thing hmm. spray yeah. and pray baby and you kind of are spraying and praying with Leon's shaky hands. I can't believe the president sent the guy with the shakes after to save his daughter. Yeah. This guy can't keep a reticle straight for his life. Uh, he's worse than like Joel in The Last of Us. Like Weapon Sway is super prominent here. Um, Leon needs to maybe cut the coffee a little bit or something. Yeah, chill out. One of the things about this game that I think also stands out quite a bit, and it also... <laughs> There's not a lot of tracks in the Resident Evil 4 soundtrack, and so it is pretty limited with how it uses music, and I think that's in line with the other games in the franchise in that regard. But there are some legitimate bangers on this score that I like quite a bit. Uh, I think Ada's mission is specifically one link that I sent to you, Max, when we were playing through this game, and I said, this song goes extremely hard. Um, and it's just the song that plays on the title screen for one of those offshoot game modes. And I think it's, is it called Ada's Mission? We keep calling it that. Mm-hmm. It's Ada's Mission. Well, there's and, Ada's Mission in separate ways. Okay. It's for Ada's Mission then, I believe. Um, okay. And, the, and the, like, the title theme for that is fantastic. It is so good. 
Um, and but then there's uh, obviously the save music theme or what? Yeah, it's the save music theme. The typewriter theme in this game is great, and that's to be expected. Um, that track is on like a 12 second loop, though. I feel like so there's not a lot to that song, but it's still good. Um, I don't know. Is there anything specific that you guys recall from the soundtrack? Uh, that you wanted to point to, or did anything in particular stand out to you? Hmm. It's interesting, because I I don't know. Sometimes I don't tune into soundtracks at all, and this is a game that I didn't feel like I really did. Um, not that it was... And I guess sometimes that's a good thing. If you don't... Like, in a movie score, sometimes they don't want you to... A, a soundtrack, if it's good, you don't necessarily notice it, because it just blends in. But I was going to say that the, I always appreciate the typewriter, even if it's... I guess from more from a mechanical standpoint, because it's like sometimes you can just hear it before you even see the typewriter. And I always love that feeling of like, ah, okay, I'm safe. I can hear that sound. So I know. Mm -hmm. I, I just wrote down it's moody and atmospheric music. So it just lends itself to the environment you're going through. And that's kind of what Dustin was saying. It's not a soundtrack you necessarily notice. It doesn't hit you in the ears right away. It's just adds to the environment. Um, which is a good sign. The save room, like you both mentioned, I think that's a Resident Evil 4 staple in general. And then the shop theme, similar. We talked about it earlier. Yeah. Whenever you see the blue flame or you see the merchant, you know the shop, like you're safe and you can spend all your money. So I think those are what stands out here. I do want to say, I mentioned it at the top of the show, if you want a, I think a deeper dive into the music of Resident Evil 4, Original sound chat episode 113, I believe. There'll be a link to it in the show notes. 119, I'm sorry. They dive into that and do, you know, critical tracks and give you the history and talk about the composer and stuff. So I definitely would recommend that. Yeah, and the as far as Ada, the Ada's mission song that I mentioned, is, is it actually called Assignment Ada? I looked this up off to the side. Is that what we keep? I think it's Assignment Ada rather than... Okay, Assignment Ada, sure. Ada's I, mission. I'm, anyway, I just want to make sure that people find the right track because the track I'm talking about is great. It's like an early 2000s drum and or late 90s almost like drum and bass track. Anyway, it's it's really good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Resident Evil games are never there's never a lot of depth with the scores, but what is there always works, and I I think that's really no different here with uh, RE4. Per usual, we're gonna have sort of a legacy wrap up discussion here, but then I did want to also make sure we talk a little bit more about the remake that's coming up, and maybe a little bit more about our hopes and dreams for that. But per usual, let's kind of talk about this game's legacy, and I think we've done a lot of it naturally over the course of this episode, and talking about how it influenced a lot of other games within the third person genre, um, whether it be with the inventory or the upgrade systems, or even just third person shooters in general because they were really not a dime a dozen until this game came out and became a massive success um, but beyond that I think it's important to look at this game within the greater context of Capcom and what this game did for the series which is one thing we kind of mentioned before which is how Resident Evil was blessed to get this game at first and then later was cursed and almost doomed the franchise because of this game in some ways but also like Capcom spun off other ideas from Resident Evil 4, which is kind of crazy when you look back on it now. Yeah. This game was greatly influential within Capcom as a company before it even came about. Like, there are ties to uh, Devil May Cry with this game. There are ties to... I mean, you know more about this than I do, Max, if you want to I mean, talk about that. Devil May Cry wouldn't exist without Resident Evil 4 yeah. being experimented on. There were four versions in development well including the final one this game went through some wonky development iterations i watched some footage of what had been shown off previously there is a time where like leon was fighting ghosts which actually seems kind of cool also in a castle i think two versions prominently in a castle which probably explains why most of the game takes place in a castle so there was this fog version Hookman version, you can see the footage and stuff and hallucination version. So they were doing some funky stuff before they settled on the main line here. But the, the progenitor virus, which apparently is in Resident Evil 5, that started in these early versions here. So it's crazy. But Devil May Cry came out of this because they wanted to make a very cool and stylish game. But then it went so far and cool and stylish that it just spun off and made Devil May Cry. It also reinvented Resident Evil. So that's 
the other pivotal part is they wanted a cool action game instead of a survival horror mostly and that ultimately leads capcom down the road of five and six which then also leads to seven and eight because the reception to those games so it's reinventing resident evil for the first time there's res- there's almost three eras of resident evil at this point and this is the start of the second era i think it's interesting to think about it's it's almost hard to pin it but you have to imagine this was like the early and i think we talked about this but the the over the shoulder view mm. which it went well beyond just like survival horror games but think about like gears of war or uncharted or something like that I, you have to imagine that this was kind of like some of the early steps towards instead of you think of like either PS1 or early other PS2 games where if you were in third person, like your character is in the the direct center, right? Like that whole shift to that kind of like almost like side over the shoulder view. You have to imagine that this was definitely part of that. It's amazing how this game has been copied in a lot of ways, but never fully successfully done ironically by its own creator specifically <laughs> thinking about um uh evil within kind of yeah. being a lo- along the same lines of this game that same over the shoulder type perspective but obviously you know it's it's no knock against evil within but obviously nowhere near the same type of legacy even from the the same creator and trying to do very similar things this game and I think we can all agree that even though we have our things that we don't like about it, it's obviously a very, very important game for many, many different reasons, just continues to get emulated in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I mean, we even we even look now, and I would say the best contemporary of this game, and it obviously released, what well, would have been, I want to say like three or four years later, would be like Dead Space, I think would be mm. the best uh, game to draw a comparison to between like a direct influence would be Dead Space. And even nowadays, like at the time we're recording this, the Callisto Protocol is about to come out. And the Callisto Protocol mm-hmm. is riffing on Dead Space, but Dead Space is directly riffing on Resident Evil 4. And that's a brand new game 17 years later that has a direct line back to Resident Evil 4 uh, that would not exist without Capcom creating this game. So it's like its influence is still being felt on games that it has by product influence. And Dead Space is being remade yeah. right now alongside Resident Evil 4. But EA, the developers that made Dead Space, they cite Resident Evil 4 as an inspiration. I always remember in the documentaries for The Last of Us, Neil talking about, Neil and Bruce talking about how Resident Evil 4 was influential in The Last of Us. The clickers w- were like their chainsaw man. was They wanted a scary thing that you heard first before you saw it. The wikipedia if this can be as the believed as the source i mean it it popularized the over the shoulder third person view and that's like dustin was saying and we've said throughout this episode it's everywhere so it's crazy that this one game kind of spawned the popularization of a certain style of game and is still being made and remade and all this stuff and drawn from today what's interesting about the legacy about this as well is just how Capcom was smart enough a few years ago to be like, okay, we were doing something right with Resident Evil four, but then we kind of screwed up and went too far. And then they rebooted the series basically with seven, but with RE two and three remake, I think they were able to finally be like, okay, what made RE four good and how can we take that and apply it to the traditional formula and use that to remake these games. And now ironically they're, you know, remaking the game. <laughs> yeah. That same form that like advanced formula and now going to be taking stuff from traditional Resident Evil. So it's interesting to see how the legacy of this game affected remakes of its prior titles as well. Kind of an interesting meta look at it. Yeah. For sure. One broad question that I want to pitch to both of you and I know Max this is something you can't answer Uh, because we are halfway into this season. Um, And Dustin, I don't know where you're at. I know you mentioned you still haven't played a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just broadly speaking, we've mentioned some problems we have with the game, but do you guys think this is the best Resident Evil game? Uh, And again, I I know you, Max, specifically, you cannot speak to all of them yet. 
But I think it's still widely considered as just like if you asked anybody on the street, not that anybody on the street is going to have played every Resident Evil game, but if you were walking the halls of uh, E3 or PAX and you asked somebody randomly what the best Resident Evil game is, like I'd say 95% of the people are going to just knee jerk reactions say Resident Evil 4. And replaying this game has made me think that that's not accurate. I think there are honestly like three, four games better in the series than this one. I think this game's legacy, as we've been talking about here, is drastically more important than any of them. I would say the only other ones that would be just as important would be Resident Evil 1, because it started everything, and then Resident Evil 7, because the RE engine is like the future of Capcom. Without the RE engine, uh, they don't have any of their big successes over the past couple of years. But is this the best Resident Evil game nowadays? Hmm. I would say no, but I understand why people say that. If you think, especially if you talk to people that are around our age, millennials, right? Like it came out at a time when you're a kid and all your friends play it. And I under, I have games like this where I am uh, totally biased towards the, the memories I had with. I'm like, this is the best. It doesn't matter if any of them play better. This is the best one. So I like am totally cool if someone feels that way. I understand that. Like I said, I have feelings like that towards games, but I, for me, like I really became a Resident Evil fan at Resident Evil 7. So I was, I'm kind of late to uh, the Resident Evil fandom, but either 7 or 2 remake, I feel like now, like, if you actually sit down and play all of them, which I haven't played all of them, like I haven't finished 5, I've never touched 6, uh, I've never played Code Veronica or 0, but I don't know. Maybe that's just me because I have fresher eyes and can try to view them more objectively. But again, I totally I'm OK with the the rose tinted glasses take as well. I, it sounds like Dustin and I have a similar history with Resident Evil. I came in at seven and I've gone back and played two and three and now four. And I played Village when it came out. Is it the best? No. Is it the most important? Arguably. I it's definitely a rose tinted glasses thing. I think like I'd play the VR version before the base version uh immediately. Like I'd recommend that to anyone before playing the traditional one and before remake is out. I think the freedom of movement and the atmosphere there works really well and surprisingly so for a game that came out in 2005 and never was imagined to even be used in VR. So I would, you know, recommend that before anything. I think the best Resident Evil is 3 Remake, but I know that's a really hot take. Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> Whoa. Yes. When you I'm sh- were talking I'm about shocked. it on Sacred Symbols, I was like, dang it, man. <laughs> Dustin and I don't agree on this. I love it. Dang, yeah. I was. I don't think 3 Remake is bad, but it uh, coming from 2 right off it, I was like, man, what happened? I had a year between them, so. <laughs> that probably helped. For yeah, sure. it helped probably a little bit, but I love three remake. I I can't wait to play it again for uh for this season of the show. I I hope we can. Uh, I'm curious to see if that holds up by the time we've played through all of them, Max, or if you have a new favorite. Yeah, comment. I'm I'm excited to see because I have so much to explore still with with zero five six code Veronica. We've got this remake that is going to be the end cap of the season. Mm-hmm. Replaying Village again, you know, now with third person and vr you know theoretically by the time who knows when psvr 2 will be out but that'll be playable in vr so there's a lot of possibility and opportunity for other games to claim the title here but i don't think four is the best as it stands so if it's not the best it could still be the best with the remake and this is one thing that i wanted to make sure we talked about a little bit more directly here before we close out uh Again, we've been talking about the remake constantly throughout this episode because it's just, you, it's hard you not can't to. at this point. Yeah, it's just virtually impossible not to. So I guess we've mentioned a lot of this throughout the episode, but speaking more directly to it, what do you, what kind of changes do you guys want in the remake? Um, obviously, I, I think it goes without saying that we want better shooting mechanics and better controls and, and all, all those obvious things. But beyond that, like, what sort of things do you want to see stick around that have been present here in the original game? Um, like one, like personally speaking, I think a lot of the iconic, uh, spiritual elements or maybe not spiritual, but just like certain things that have become part of this game's DNA, like 
Leon flipping out a window like that is still in the remake based on what we've seen in the trailers now he's still doing that crazy somersault out of a window uh, that's greatly over the top like those are the type of little things that I think need to stay in this game Uh, as far as what can be improved um, the story can do a lot better um, especially by 2022 storytelling standards in video games back the, back in this day we were still very much here's a gameplay sequence here's a cut scene here's a gameplay sequence here's a cut scene and it would just kind of go back and forth in that way and uh for remake will probably still be the same in that regard to some degree but they can do more with leon's character i think other than just making him this passive suave cool dude who's out here in the middle of nowhere trying to save the president's daughter uh what do you guys think dustin what kind of ideas are you really hoping to see them put into the remake so some of it, I feel like we're the things that I want, we're already starting to see threads of, in particular, just the way that they can expand certain, not even just sections, but scenarios. Specifically in the trailer, we saw the introduction scene where Leon's going into the first house, and it's much more involved than just walking in and seeing a dude at a fireplace. Like he goes down in the basement, there's like a guy with his jaw like half or it's like whole head is like sideways. And um, so seeing that expansion kind of like making it more scary by modern standards as well, just because this game now really isn't scary at all. And I, I was trying to figure that out because I was like, I remember this game being scary, but I was also a lot younger at the time. So I don't know if it's that, but a lot of, I mean, even in games like, playing the first Silent Hill is not really as scary probably as it once was just because things are different now. From a combat perspective as well, I'm glad that they're keeping it to be somewhat actiony as well and I think that's one thing they really tried to emphasize in the trailer was like him running around the village like the the cow catching on fire and stuff like that. Like they definitely weren't trying to to ground it in any way and I think that's probably the other main aspect is that They've kept the other remakes campy, and I think that they're going to do the same with this one. Like, are they going to have the 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 bingo line in this game? Uh, I really I think hope they've so. Already, I think they've already confirmed that it is in there. They yeah. confirmed that? Okay, good. Because they had that, and then like when he lights the, the cow on fire, he's like, oh yeah, bill me later. It's like, okay, this is good. <laughs> they, they, they know what people want. And so, and I think I talked earlier just about like the idea of taking your established sections of this game and making them more traditional resident evil in whether it's, it's puzzles or collecting items, backtracking stuff like that. Like the layout, the template is there. Like the blueprint is totally ready to go for the expansion. And also just the idea of like redeeming some of the parts that we didn't like as much like the Island. Like how do you make that less of a chore and more interesting Capcom right now is like on its A game. So I feel like, and based on what we've seen, it's like, it just seems like it's going to be a home run. I kind of like the two of you said, I want them to lean more into the horror bits of it. The opening village is iconic as an opening to any game. And clearly they're messing with some stuff there with sideways heads and blood and more ritualistic stuff. I mean, this is a cult that has taken over a village lean into that how has that infiltrated the lives of these people and how does that seep into the castle where's the web i would like that sort of stuff to be more present i want the the las plagas in your blood i want that to feel more like a threat i'm not saying it turn into a mechanic where if i don't do something in a timely manner i just i want that to have a bit more weight to it i think they have a real opportunity to subvert expectations as well. This game is so intimately known. It's been on every console since the GameCube. It's, I mean, it's been on an iPod Touch for Pete's sake. Subvert the expectations with the audience. In the most recent state of play, direct, whatever it's called these days from Capcom, when the chainsaw guy comes through and slices down the the scaffolding around and then leon blocks the chainsaw with a knife that's awesome and that's a subversion that also adds to the ridiculous over the top action nature of it in that super fun way of course leon is blocking a chainsaw with a knife as if that would ever be possible so keep that up how do we how do we do that with the trolls how do we do that with the the lake the castle 
the lava room, boss fights. Where can they surprise people in a game that's been around for 17 years? And then the story stuff, tie more of that lore into the narrative or make those pickups a bit more, I'm not saying make the pickups super obvious, but let us soak in this world and this lore, maybe tie Umbrella a bit more into it. I like it when Umbrella has a presence. Getting Wesker kind of just name dropped later on and Ada, it just feels like, oh yeah, this is a Resident Evil game, so they're still here, don't worry about it. You know, maybe have Sadler have more of a tie to them in some way, or I don't know. I I guess if Wesker's trying to steal the, the virus, they don't have a tie, but more Umbrella. Umbrella's fun, and I want to. I like it when they're involved. Oh, and the whole thing to be playable in PSVR too, please. please. Whoa, that'd be. Sick. If they can do it with seven, and they can do it with Village, let's do it with four. They can. They can. They can repurpose a third-person game into a VR game. Yes, it clearly can be done. If <laughs> if Armature can do it, it's built from the ground up, and RE Engine is clearly capable of it. They. That's a lot of dev time, I guess. Is what I'm saying. But they took Village. Village is a first-person game, now a third-person game, and a VR game. I'm just saying, yeah. they could do mm-hmm. it. Please. We'll see. Uh, the one thing I have to specifically mention that I am the most morbidly curious to see in the remake, if they still do or not, is Mecha Gundam Salazar stomping after you across that bridge sequence oh. when you are going to the lighthouse. That seems so over the top that I could see them cutting it, but it's also one of those things that I desperately want to remain in the game and not be touched whatsoever. But what so, if it was turned into a boss fight instead? I'd be fine with that as long then, as it stays in the game. I just need a ro- giant Salazar robot in that game for no reason at all for a five minute sequence. So I like just it. keep it in, please. Hmm. Shout out to Mike. The uh, helicopter pilot once again, fallen hero, <laughs> and uh, really shook up Leon. So apparently they were they were pals. Give and, us a uh, cut scene with hero. Mike. More Mike lore, please. Yeah, that's what we need. Mike lore. Maybe show them getting drinks. You know, like Leon mm-hmm. said, drinks on Leon. All right, I think that does it for our Resident Evil Four discussion. Thank you so much for listening. If you like, you can follow the show at Chapter Select. You can follow Logan on Twitter at moreman12 and his writing over at comicbook.com. You can follow myself on Twitter at maxroberts143 and my writing over at maxfrequency.net. And you can follow Dustin on Twitter at dustincanfly. He's the executive producer over at Last Stand Media. You can listen to uh, Sacred Symbols. They've got a bunch of stuff over there uh, on their Patreon. You guys just started like a a fantasy league with uh, sales figures, right? Sacred Sales or something? The Sacred Sales Saga. I think I just am starting to understand what we're doing. It's really not that crazy. It's about you know predicting the top selling games on on uh, the PlayStation Network. But yeah, we do all kinds of uh, weird and and fun stuff like that, and interviews, and obviously Sacred Symbols. The main show is the the main thing. Uh, which if you got four hours every week to listen to you, we've got you covered. So if you've got four hours to burn, head on over. Or three, you know, three, three, now, three four. to three to four. Yeah. It depends on the day. Thank you so much, Dustin, for joining us. And thank you all for listening. And until next time, adios. Chapter Select is a Max Frequency production. This episode was researched, produced, and edited by me, Max Roberts. Season 5 is hosted by Logan Moore and myself. Season 5 is all about Resident Evil. For more on this season, go to chapterselect.com forward slash season 5. Follow the show at Chapter Select. And check out previous seasons at chapterselect.com.